I'm not going to give you Andre's bio. He literally has a Wikipedia page. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Some of you may not have seen an Andre talk before, and I kind of envy you. Because those of you who have seen one know the experience they're about to have for the first time. Uh, you're going to laugh, you're going to learn, and when you go home, I haven't heard it yet, but I can guarantee this will be the talk you will tell other people about. So get ready. Thank you. I don't need it. Okay. This is a famous algorithm. Everybody knows it. It's just implemented in Assembler. When you figure out what it is, raise your hand. You've got 15 seconds. I just want your attention. It's, not, it's just some random code. All right. <laughs> Official announcement. Herb's going to do book signing after this talk. There's no time mentioned. It's going to end when it's going to end. All right? And he's going to wait. I talked to him. He's going to wait until it ends. Your prisoners here. And this is because we have a shell of material to go through. It's absolutely great. What? Sorry. Excuse me. Sorry, it's a confusion. I said shed load. I said shed load. It's a word. It's a decent word. It's in the Cambridge Dictionary. Cambridge, like not Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge Brexit. Okay? Too soon? So it's a word. So, what's the deal with sorting? What is the deal with sorting? Well, it's just the most researched problem in computer science ever. Like, you know, if you Google, like, uh, if you go to scholar.google.com and look for sorting algorithms, it's just a bazillion papers, and the most recent is 2019. And it is like it's meaningful. It's not like an analysis of yet. It's new sort algorithms and new stuff. It's absolutely amazing. So sorting is absolutely the fundamental problem of computer science. CS complete, if you wish. It's like the basic. It's if you're a musician, you gotta play prelude for Anna Maria Magdalena Bach at any instrument you play. If you're a yoga, I, I heard a good laugh there. If you're a yoga guy, you got to do like savasana. I don't know. Like savasana, is, I, I can do savasana. It's like you lay on your back and do nothing. That's awesome. <laughs> so if you're a programmer, you got to implement sort once in your life. Just got to do it. Sit down and do it. And it's not even very difficult because we have a number of consecrated algorithms of which quick sort would be naturally the first to come to mind. So why is it so popular in all implementations of standard libraries uh, for C++ and other libraries for C++ and other languages? You're going to find quick sort like the prima donna of uh, sort implementations. Now, it's, very, it's a very nice algorithm. It makes a lot of sense. It's the textbook application of divide and conquer. It just, you can spend time and talent and, you know, kind of a lot of uh, insight on corner cases to optimizing it because it's so simple. It's easy to analyze. Actually, it's kind of interesting. Quick sort is easier to analyze than quick select, which is a simpler algorithm. So quick sort, you know, it's just easy. The math is not difficult. Quick select is absolutely crazy. You can't, I actually like the, the latest and greatest, like they had to use mathematical software to analyze it because they couldn't go, the formula comes like several, it's more difficult than Einstein's general relativity, okay? Maybe I'm exaggerating it just a bit. So um, it, one nice thing about quick sort is it does very little work on data that's almost sorted or sorted. If you code it right, if you kind of take care of it and everything, it's going to kind of work very nice. And it has this very nice property, idempotence, which is also a polite word. And meaning, it, if the data is already sorted, it's not going to shuffle it. 
there are sorting algorithms that are going to shuffle data even if it's sorted, such as, such as, thank you, heap sort. The first order of business in heap sort is we got to put the largest element at, you know, at the very back of the array. The first order of business, let's take the greatest element and put it at the front of the array. So heap sort, like worst case in heap sort is just as good as the average case, which is kind of like they had to fight that. It's kind of a, a fundamental disadvantage heap sort has. Not to say there's been a lot of people who, who spent time on improving it, but eh, you know, heap sort has difficulties. And uh, it's kind of, on average, it's fast. And that's kind of a you know, computer thing. Computers like to be fast on average. They don't want to be fast in the best case or the worst. They want to be fast on average for large data sets. And quick sort, last but not least, is well balanced across comparison swaps, meaning it doesn't do too many compares compared to swaps. It doesn't do too many, you know, kind of does about comparable. When with a native, uh, naive implementation of quick sort, <coughs> uh, the usual is like two recursions, but I replace one recursion with a loop just to be clear. Right? So it's one recursion and one loop. Nothing to see here except we have a primitive partition pivot that's going to choose a pivot somehow, and it's going to make sure that it uh, arranges the array such that everything littler than, less than the pivot is going to be on the left side, and everything that's greater than the pivot is going to come on the right side. And then you're, you're going to uh, sort the two ha remaining halves of the array. The ideal case, the partition finds the exact middle of the array, the median, and is going to nicely divide the array into equal halves, and that's going to be uh, uh, the best case. The worst case, of course, is when you find a bad pivot and you're going to kind of make no progress, so almost no progress, it's just going to sort one element. So the less naive implementation that I submit for your attention is with early stopping. So quick sort uses early stopping, meaning whenever the array to be subarray to be sorted is less than a threshold, it's going to say, you know what, I'm, I'm done here. So I'm going to delegate that, uh, the task of sorting that little array that's left, I'm going to delegate that task to a different routine. That's, special, that's good for small arrays, it's bad for big arrays. Problem being, quick sort is great for big arrays, it's terrible for small arrays. Right? So if you crack open any standard library implementation, you're going to find something like this. And actually I did, and the uh, threshold is 32 on Visual Studio, and it's 16 on GNU, different philosophies, I guess, Windows, Linux, I don't know. And Clank makes a very interesting choice, which we're going to talk a bit more about. It makes, uh, it, it tunes the threshold depending on the characteristics of the input. So it's going to say, well, you know, if the, if the type you're giving me to sort is trivial, trivially movable and assignable, then I'm going to use a larger threshold. Otherwise, I'm going to choose a smaller threshold. And we're going to roll like that. So all of a sudden, we see this interesting notion. You tune, a met, this is called a meta parameter. I'm not, I'm not making this up. So meta parameter is a parameter to the algorithm that's not, in, that's not passed on by the user, but it's kind of chosen uh, in a sort of a hidden way. So the threshold meta parameter is chosen by Clang depending on some relatively obscure characteristics of the input. So you know, keep that in mind because I believe it's an interesting uh, tidbit. And for now, we're going to gloss, gloss over the patholo pathological cases, um, you know, kind of whenever it becomes quadratic. And there's a, there's a meta algorithm, if you wish, called IntroSort that's going to detect, monitor and detect the performance of QuickSort. Whenever things go bad, it's going to just uh, throw everything out and fall back to heap sort or some other algorithm, right? So it's just going to redo. But, you know, these pathological ca uh, cases uh, never come up except when they come. And we're going to see one. It's amazing. Uh, but for now, let's, uh, let's gloss over that. So the implementation we have right now is uh, decent, let's say. So now, the, we're going to focus on small sort. Small, sorting small arrays. 
I'm going to bore you the rest of the, I'm not kidding, I'm going to bore you the rest of the stock with sorting small arrays. It's not just really very small arrays because, well, for large inputs we just talk like quick sort is great. For very small inputs like five, ten elements, we, know, we have optimal solutions that are hard coded. Right? You just sit down and it's actually a hard problem to find like the optimal sort for like 15 elements. And uh, over the years, people have found better and better algorithms for, for small sort and they got to the theoretical minimum for up to 15 elements. Now the problem is if you sort 15 elements with uh, one of those road routines, what's gonna happen is it's gonna be a very large routine. So we don't like that. So that's why I'm saying it's kind of solved with air codes because it's not really solved, it's kind of in, you know, in flux. But essentially from a theoretical standpoint at least, it is a solved problem. Small arrays, you know, we're done. So now the challenge, the real challenge is nobody knows how to really sort fast like 1,000 elements. We have no idea. So that's what we're gonna work on. Like a dog with a bone, we're gonna, small, we're gonna sort these medium-sized arrays, hundreds of elements, and we're gonna see what's what. So the challenge is in this algorithm that we just uh, discussed, increased threshold without compromising performance. This is the topic. By the way, so th this was submitted as a tech talk, not a keynote. And it was a late submission, so John said, eh, I'm not sure if I can sneak you in. So then John says nothing, like, I'm, like my talk was not accepted, John said nothing for like a month. And then I get an email like from Michael Spurtis, he said, congratulations, what for? He says, oh, for your keynote. What keynote? <laughs> CPPCon, you're on the front page of CPPCon. I was like, oh my goodness, this was a talk for like 30 people. <laughs> like people are interested in efficiency and that kind of stuff, like, you know, highly niche. And so on the way to, from, the, from the airport to here, I'm thinking, you know what, maybe I don't put my seatbelt on, there's an accident, I die, I don't have to be here. <laughs> so anyhow, going on with the show. So our, this is our, this is our like monomaniacal, uh, monomaniacal like, uh, focus here. We want to sort smallish, hundreds of elements, a race fast. This is it. So let's see what they do, like in GNU and Clang and Visual Studio, what do they do? They do what's called optimistic insertion sort. Starting from the left, you're gonna do a linear, it's gonna have like um, a progression in the array. This portion is gonna be sorted, this portion is gonna be unsorted, and you're, going, you're going to do a linear search backwards in the sorted portion for the new element, and you're going to insert it by moving everything else. So, uh, just for illustration, uh, courtesy of uh, uh, Code for Geeks, uh, you're gonna have like these uh, green elements being inserted in the red portion of the array which is already sorted. And as you can see here, for example, here I'm saying that this is the worst case, worst case, this is best case, is there's no move, there's no moving because it's already in the right place. Another best case, and here you have another worst case, and you have some kind of a meh case, right? Yeah, I'm gonna have to insert the, the five here. And all is good and dandy, except uh, the complexity in the worst case is gonna be quadratic because you gotta, you know, you do the linear searches and you do the linear uh, moveroo, swapping that around and all that nonsense, right? So we don't like that. However, it turns out that, uh, you know, for smaller race, it's pretty good. So for example, the average number comparison is gonna be half the worst case, it's just a simple distribution there. Um, so it's gonna be like 248 comparisons and swaps for uh, 32 elements. So that strikes me like quite a fair amount of those which we want to reduce, agreed? I hope we, this is kind of you know, a bit of overkill, right? So we don't like that. So of course, those fools who spend their careers implementing standard libraries, they never heard of binary search, but I did, so let me try it. And of course, I, I knew there's something uh, wrong with binary, binary insertion because nobody does it. And there are people who like, you know, they, they, they wake up and they think of it. I'm like thinking of like five minutes a day, right? So it's like, well, wait a second, what's going on here? So you're gonna figure out what's, what's going on here. So the, the uh, strategy now is let's do binary search instead of linear search and that way we gain a lot. For example, C of 32, the number of comparisons of 32 elements 
dropped down by a lot for 250 to 155. So it's a slam dunk right there. So let me code it and test it. And we got a very neat 15% reduction of comparisons. I mean, quick sort on 1 million elements using this binary insertion sort as, uh, as the fallback for a small arrays. And we get to a very nice, um, from 23 million something comparisons to 22 million, so we're looking at 15% win in the number of comparisons, which is awesome. So I instrumented the code, I ran the test, I was very happy about it, I was jumping up and down the house, and I've uh, measured a 13% pessimization of the runtime. 13% worse with fewer comparisons. No book is gonna tell you that. Forget Cormac, throw it away. No book is gonna tell you that. So I go, oh, no problem, I'm gonna mess with the threshold and stuff, nothing works. Binary insertion sort is always slower than optimistic linear insertion sort. Like all, for all metaparameters possible, I tried. And obviously the standard library implementers don't do that because they measured and they saw it's bad, so why do it? So I got to thinking, what's going on here? <clears throat> and I thought, well, it's, it must be about predictability and entropy, informational entropy. Consider this, when you do a linear search in that uh, simple insertion sort of linear version, each search is going to have one failure per search at the end, when you found it. So we're gonna have a success rate of, uh, of comparisons there, like that's gonna be huge, it's gonna be like 90%. However, the binary search is in the exact opposite. Each binary search, by its definition, information is going to extract one bit of information. It's the most uh, information revealing test you can make, the binary, you know, I'm gonna search in the middle. That's a, you gain the most information that way. So it has the, you know, the most, uh, it's like the best thing you can do from an informational standpoint. And it's the worst you can do from the point of, uh, from the viewpoint of? Who said cache? Oh. Branch predictor, right, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to single anyone out, so. so the branch predictor is gonna be super happy uh, just, you know, just going with pre highly predictable comparisons, but when it comes to a binary search, the branch predictor is essentially gonna have 50% chances of doing anything right, right? So it's just gonna be, branch prediction is powerless. And I made this very unpleasant realization. I like maybe like, um, you know, like all of us have like a couple of meters of algorithm books at home and at work, right? You, you could kill an ox with one, right? And, you know, all research and all textbooks and all the classic literature goes minimize comparisons and you're gonna be happy. Minimize comparisons, you're gonna be happy. You know what, I'm not happy. I ain't happy. So, well, what do we do now? So, what? what What's gonna, and if you, if you thought it's not weird enough, there exists such a thing which is called branchless binary search. So I coded that too. Like, oh, if uh, branchy is not good, then branchless is gonna be awesome. Branches, branchless has a different problem though. It can't do early stopping. Branchless, you're gonna go through all the bits. You're gonna have to like go all the log n steps all the way down, and so essentially there's no early stopping for it. For each search, you're gonna have to go all, you know, log n operations. So actually, branchless is even slower than binary than branchy binary search. So I was kind of dead, dead in the water here. Uh, more ideas. Let's see what to do. What to do. Well, uh, inspiration from Tinder, you know those ads on Tinder that say, I want somebody who's like strong but also sensitive? <laughs> I want, you know, somebody who can wear like a, a fancy dress but also like uh, hiking boots at the same time, right? And 
I want an, someone who's smart but also boring. I want an algorithm that is smart but also boring. So it's boring enough to make the branch predictor happy, and it's also smart enough to kind of beat the baseline. All right. Who saw the Silicon Valley show? All right, so you know middle out compression. Awesome. So how about middle out insertion? We start from the middle and go like that. We take advantage of the fact that we have two places we can grow the, uh, the sorted portion. We keep the sorted portion in the middle and we grow it like that. And that way you get to swap half the times because you don't just swap, you don't, you don't just insert here and swap like everything. You insert here, swap only a little thing. So on average, you're having the number of swaps. Whoa! Let's call that out, middle out sort. Awesome, all right. We're gonna patent this. So you code it very carefully. So by the way, whenever you code things like this, be very careful to not do extra work. So you're gonna start from the middle and notice one detail here, which is gonna come again and again. Here, size and one. Auto write equals first plus one plus size and one. I'm positioning myself in the middle of the array, but depending on whether the array has an even or odd number of elements, I wanna position myself differently because you know the middle of, uh, if it's uh, an array with an odd number of elements, I want to position myself just a bit sideways so I'm gonna grow the right way. Otherwise, I'm gonna have two things that are identical. I end up doing extra work. So notice how here I'm integrating there's not, there's not if here. I'm integrating a conditional within the arithmetic. So there's no if size and one, uh, you know, uh, right plus plus. Right, this is gonna be a lot faster it turns out because it's a, it's a compare without a jump. If you code it as an if, it's going to be a compare with a jump, big difference, okay? Always try to integrate conditionals within your arithmetic. Just the condition is like a Boolean, it's an integer that's zero or one, that's it. Consider it an integer that's zero or one and then you know, make it flow through the calculation. So this is I think a highly, you know, highly thought, of, thought of, highly optimized version of uh, what I would call middle out insertion sort. But by the way, don't think we're very <laughs> original here. Like, me and many of you and 10,000 undergraduate students in India have coded this, okay? So it's a, you know, there's a, a whole cottage industry, there's a little community of people who write variations of insertion sort. There's a cabal if you wish, they want to take over the world, okay? There's just a bunch of people who devise, they spend their days devising this kind of stuff. Two at a time insertion, K at a time insertion, shell sort, binary merge sort, Library sort a very recent algorithm, all of these can be considered uh, insertion sort variants. So we're not, you know, we're not gonna patent this, we're not, you know. So, awesome. 7% better comparisons for the million doubles. 13% better moves as expected, we gain on moves big time. However, no significant improvement in time run. And this is where you can make a difference. Because at this point you can quit. Or at this point you can say, I'm gonna make this the purpose of my life right now. <laughs> hey. So what to do? And if you know, every, every keynote has a having time, like you know, by tomorrow this time you're gonna forget everything I said. But if there's one thing I want you to remember is try silly things. Because trying the smart things didn't work, did it? <laughs> trying the good things did just didn't help me one bit, did it? So how about I try something stupid? See how the hell that goes. So we're gonna go the other way. We're gonna acknowledge that the computer gods are so complicated in their you know, willingness and whatever they do that we're gonna give up on that. I don't want to understand what's going on. And because I don't understand, I'm going to try things that don't make absolutely no sense. And let's see what the hell happens. Ready? I heard one yes, like literally. Like, <laughs> like one, like golf intensity, yes. Yes, please. 
So here's the show of thought that motivates this. The, the, you know, what's bad about this is whenever you move things, if you move small elements in large sorted subarrays, you're going to spend a lot of swaps. So the problem is like the small elements are too much to the right. So I want to have some pre-processing that brings the statistically smaller elements to the left, so then when I do the insertion sort, it's going to be better swap-wise. Enter stupid small sort. Stupid small sort. You know, we have smart pointers and everything. How about some stupid algorithm? Right? Stupid small sort. And it's going to do two things. Make heap and the classic insertion sort. Thank you very much. I'm almost sorry there's no rotate in there. <laughs> I mean, I wish they were like, by rotating just works awesomely. So I, I lead, this is it. I'm doing extra work. Because I'm comparing this with the same function in which I come on the first line. So literally, we're doing more work. Instead of just calling insertion sort, let's make a heap before, which is kind of a structure that has its own interesting properties. And it's kind of a, you know, kind of a fine-tuned thing, an interesting, delicate structure. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make one of these interesting, delicate, dainty structures. And then like an idiot, I'm going to forget all about it, and I'm going to do a stupid insertion sort all over it with no regard for the structure of the heap. Is this stupid enough? Right? No. We want more stupid. OK. Let me, let me. <laughs> Don't test me. Here's, one, uh, here's a little improvement. I'm going to use unguarded insertion sort. Raise your hand if you got it. I see one hand in the, in the literal last row, one hand, and with the middle finger pointed up. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> he was like, what? <laughs> so here's, I shared this with a mathematician I'm corresponding with, a brilliant mathematician, also a brilliant hacker. He has like all these awesome like uh, routines. And, so he, he first didn't understand what I, what I meant to do. It was so stupid. He, he said, I don't understand what you, want, what, you plan, what you want to do here. I said, make a heap and then play in session sort. And that was his, all, his email. That was the entire email he sent me. Very motivating. <laughs> so let's recall the, here, I do have an angle here, ladies and gentlemen, everybody. Like, I do have, an, I do have a thing. And my thing is the following. In a heap, you're going to have the very smallest element at the top of the heap. I.e., it's in an array, it's going to be the very first element of the array. So it's going to be the smallest element at the beginning of the array, and everybody's happy. Everybody's happy because then I can do this unguarded insertion sort, meaning I don't need to do bounce checking when I test for inequality going down the array. Because you can't be smaller than the smallest. So sooner or later, you're going to hit somebody that's, that's smaller than you, and then you're done, and you insert the, the element. So if you know for a fact that the smallest element in the little array is at the very beginning of the array, you don't need to do bounce checking. Agreed? Awesome. And why is this begin plus 3 here? It's not begin and it's begin plus three. What's with three? Yes, I'm hearing some good points. So it's begin plus three because the first is the smallest. The second is going to be something greater than the smallest. So the first two are already sorted. So I start with inser inserting a third element into the sorted portion of the two first elements. Believe me, this three is 3%. I am not kidding. So it's this kind of stuff. Make sure you do the work that needs to be done, but not extra. Extra work is not being compensated in computer science. No, it's not like school. Don't do extra work. So that's why, you know, that's my whole idea. I'm going to statistically, yeah, I'm going to put the smallest in the front, which is a huge advantage to start with. Awesome. I don't need to do bounce checking. And then, it's, you, if you look at these subarrays here, like, you know, 1, 2, 17, 25, 1, 3, 7. So I'm going to have 
a few sort, sorted sub, you know, streaks within the array. The way this is uh, arranged, by the way, the heap, when you arrange it, you know, it's just in order traversal. So it's gonna be one, two, three, 17, 19, 36, seven, 25, 100, and that's my array. Now, this array is not sorted. It's far from being sorted. And in fact, if you look at the, that seven there, right, or it's 36 times before seven, so it's, again, it's not sorted at all. However, it does have this partial sorting behavior. So what I'm trying to do here by calling make heap is to essentially put my, my array in a, in, a, in a topology that's going to make it favorable for insertion sort. Let's take a look. So we measure, we set up the rig, we measure when we get a very nice improvement, 9% improvement in comparisons, a, whole, a whopping 20% less in swaps. A lot less data moves. By doing more work. So I find that fascinating. It's like, it's a gambit. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm gonna do this extra work in hope that uh, I'm arranging things for the next stage, right? 9% pessimization. My wife and kids hated that day. <laughs> they didn't like that day. I was grumpy and kind of, what the hell is happening here? Leave me alone, right? So I'm looking at a 9% pessimization. But there is hope. Because maybe, you know, the direction is real good. So I'm reducing a lot of metrics by a lot. And you know, maybe I'm gonna increase threshold and experiment with that because now I can afford to increase threshold just because I, I reduce the swaps and the, the comparison so much. So I can play with that. And I actually can start to micro-optimize. Dear colleagues, it's time to put the hard hats on and go down in the mine to shake hands with the devil. <laughs> Micro-optimization. The way to transform an array into a heap is called Floyd's algorithm. It's from the 60s. Great algorithm, very nice. From half of the, from either rate down to zero, you're going to insert into the partial subheap sub -heap below. And you're going to done after inserting the root, which is element at index zero, sorry, on this side. So the way uh, it's done on Rosetta code is just you have this shift down routine called in a loop, and that's pretty much it. And the shift down routine itself is kind of hairy. So looking here at eh, we have like uh, you know, some calculations and stuff, and we have like one, two conditionals, three, four conditionals, five conditionals, a swap. So we have quite a bit of work within the inner loop. Remember, this is a loop inside a loop, right? So I have a loop in a loop, right? So we got five compare and jump decisions points, and we have three adds and shifts, and six assignments, and we must work on reducing this. What do you do to improve an algorithm that is implemented in a standard library? You look how they do it in the standard library. I gotta give it to the folks who implement the standard library. They gotta write all of, all of those underscores. All of those damn underscores is just killing me. Just, you know, just for that, they should get a bonus. Like every year, the underscore premium you got right, right now. <laughs> underscore bonus, here it go, like 10% of your salary. This is it for like, you know, extra dangers in your work. But actually it's a very meaningful algorithm. So I looked at it, I analyzed it, and you know, it's kind of what also the other libraries do. And um, they use moves instead of swaps, number one. So they use, the, they take advantage of std move and friends. So instead of swapping things around, they kind of register things. So they move into a register and then they move back from the register into the thing. And for doubles, move is gonna be a no op. It's gonna be a simple assignment. So essentially, in my code, I'm not gonna have the move, but you can assume that for a general algorithm, we're gonna have the appropriate moves in, uh, in there. And the inner loop is two comparisons and jumps and four arithmetic and two assignments, and the outer loop, there's a, a bunch of fix-up code to handle last node. Let me explain what the deal with the last node here, because this last node, I hate it. All right, so what's the size of this array? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I have a nine element array. What if you had the 10 element array? There would be a, a child for the 19, 
element, right? This guy. So this node would have a child, but an only child. It turns out whenever it do that uh, thing, that spoiled brat of a child is gonna just mess up things. Because you need to test in every iteration there whether this is a, a heap with a lone child or a, a heap with two siblings. And that's what GNU does, that's what Microsoft does, that's what everybody does. They're just going to test for this uh, in here, actually. You can see this is the fix up for the lone child. So very unpleasant and uh, you know, I kind of spend a lot of time thinking, how can I eliminate this situation? I hope you're gonna like this. We're going to ignore the spoiled brat. We're gonna treat that, the, you know, the lone child, if it exists, we're gonna treat it as if it doesn't exist. So we're going to make a heap without the last element. But if only there was a method to uh, push an element that's not in a heap into the heap. Push heap. So you make a heap for the advantages case, which is faster, and then you have one node at the very end, and then you call push heap and it's in the heap log and cost, and you're done. And you save all the comparisons in the loop. So you save a lot, and in the end it's like, yeah, fine, I'm gonna push heap. Um, oh, and one more thing about optimization. It's very good to study the standard library because you're gonna see that there's people for whom like waste of work is like black lung to miners. They just, they, they, they're gonna debate every single cycle. Every single cycle lost is going to end up on their forehead. So if you optimize, I think a very good state of mind is, you know, I want every, I want to draw every cycle possible from this code. I want to be able to defend everything I do in a court of law. This is the attitude. And if you look at Rosetta code, that's not the attitude, which is fine because for teaching. But if you've got a standard library implementation, you're gonna see that there's people with that attitude. And we're going to do just the same. First, insertion sort heap, stupid sort. A sort first last, you know, whatever the, the arrays well formed. I'm gonna compute a size, and then if the size is less than tr three, I'm going to do a simple routine, which is sort first zero and first size equals two. What the heck is that? Who knows? Well, if size is two, it's gonna be sort two, you know, sort two elements is like swap them if they're, you know, they're not, not ordered, right? So sort two is like a trivial. But the thing is, you sort two first of zero and first of one if size is two. But if size is not two, size is gonna be one. So you're going to sort first of zero and first of zero, which is a, does nothing. The key point here being that you integrate conditionals within your arithmetic, ladies and gentlemen, everybody else, please understand this is crucial. You don't want ifs, you just want booleans within your calculations, right? And then we're gonna make heap and we're gonna do the um, unguarded essential sort. This is my stupid sort. Make heap. I'm going to start with the first parent. It turns out to be size minus three by two. It turns out many implementations, they do size minus one by two and they're wrong. They, they do more work. And then I'm going to compute the first right kid, which is like the, you know, the, the first right kid of the parent, which is gonna be the first parent plus one times two. So that's gonna be my simple calculation. I just want to save that calculation doing over and over again, because then I'm going to simply decrement the parent and decrement the first right kid and that's my outer loop. By the way, this is an infinite loop. As of 2019, I announced that I'm always going to use infinite loops. I give, I, re, I renege, I give up finite structure loops, therefore bad people. I'm done with finite loops. No more structure loops. I'm gonna use infinite loops for all my work. Firm commitment, well, except for like most loops, but 
That's <laughs> all right. And then if the size is uh, not numbered, then nothing to do because it was one of those heaps with uh, both children at the end. But otherwise, I have one more kid to push, called push heap. And we're done. Very nice. Outer loop, so I'm putting this on different slides because it's just uh, the code doesn't fit. So outer loop, remember we had this uh, first right kid and first parent, and we uh, have the element that must go down. Let's call it Lucifer because it goes down. Right, naming, the hardest problem in computer science. So I'm going to compare with Lucifer and stuff and whatnot, so this is my, my outer loop. Notice that this cannot be transferred into a structure loop. It has this break just before the end of the loop, but if you break here, you're not gonna do these two operations, and it turns out this is important. That's why I don't, I repudiate structured for loops, okay? The pit of fell, the inner loop. Here we are in the core of Chernobyl. <laughs> and actually that's an apt metaphor because the density of current inside the CPU is the same, is compared to the same order of magnitude as the density of current in a nuclear reactor. And that's because the density is like division by the area through which the current is, the area is like division by zero, it's very small. But the density is huge, it's humongous. So this is the pit of hell. Every cycle, every, every percent of a cycle here matters. And here's what we're gonna do, which nobody does. Constant of junior equals right kid minus comparison result. No if. So I compute the best ch child to uh, use for my uh, decisions. I choose the child by doing arithmetic, not testing, not decisions, not jumps. So I pick up the right kid, it's either the right kid or right kid minus one, which turns out to be the left kid. And then I, you know, I, I, um, I move on, I, I register this particular, I move from this uh, A of junior to current, and then I compare and break early. And I do my operations to update parent and right kid, and I have a go-to. What? Bring it, yes, thank you. So I have a go, I'm not ashamed, it saves me one test. If you can replace this with a structured loop, I'll eat it. <laughs> thank you, Bjarne, for leaving go-to in the language in spite of pressure. This go-to is the most honorable thing I've done in my life, okay? <laughs> so I, I stand by it. So then I had the push sheep. Guess what? Push sheep is slow. Like push sheep implemented by, the, the, you know, by GNU and by Clang and by VS is slow. You know why it's slow? Because they use structured loops. Because they use finite four. And they do more work. The problem here with push sheep is that how many times do I iterate this loop here in a push heap? It's log n times, it's a short, it's a small amount of times. It's like five times. If you iterate a loop one million times and you do a, a bit of extra work at the millionth time, it's just fine. But if you do it five or six or 10 times and you do extra work at the end of the 10th time, then you're losing 10%, right? So here, this loop is very carefully written so that it breaks the hell out of the loop as soon as humanly possible. So it looks at the parent, computes the parent, and registers the AI and the parent. It breaks early here, and again it breaks early here, and everybody else in the STL implementation is going to do this extra work, this extra assignment, which is measurable because this is the pit of hell. This is where the action goes. This is gonna be executed millions and millions of times. So new rule, always use infinite loops. <laughs> Except of course for most cases, but always. Am I clear? Always use infinite loops, except most cases, but always. All right, I, I don't make the rules, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just like saying what happens. All right, so don't forget this. 
All right, so let's uh, make a bit of analysis here. In the inner loop, we have three comparisons, but only two comparison jumps, so we're good. And we have only two arithmetics and two assigns, so we're good. So let's put this to the test. And we're getting close. We're getting close, but not quite there. We're within 2%. But now, remember, we reduced swaps, we reduced comparisons, so we're in good shape. We cannot increase threshold. We can increase the small size, the size of the small arrays that we're sorting. And finally, after millennia of work, we got it. If you set a threshold to 63, you enjoy a good win, 2%. You reduce swaps, you re so essentially it's good for everybody. It's good for, you know, all metrics are better including time. So laboratories get only better because they're going to have um, you know, more expensive comparisons and more expensive swaps. So you know, everything's gonna do better than double. So double is kind of the worst case in a way. <laughs> I'm gonna use this template for the rest of my slides because now we're gonna get into completely like weird territory here. I was kidding, it's just. But, consider this. Let's uh, plot comparisons as a function of the threshold, and of course comparisons are gonna grow with the threshold. This is expected with the quadratic thing, and I'm very happy to see that comparisons with uh, the blue, which is the insertion sort, uh, the heap insertion sort, they're gonna grow slower. So that's nice, that's good. But comparisons increase with the threshold. So it gets worse if you increase the threshold. That's fine. Same about swaps, uh, moves, you know, so a swap is kind of two moves. Same about swaps, we're doing better in moves, uh, you know, we're doing better with the blue plot, there are fewer, um, and, but it's, also, it's just growing, right? With the threshold, it's kind of a problem. And this is the weird thing. Time continues to drop. We're, all the metrics are go going worse, but the time continues to go better. I kid you not, this is one of the weirdest moments in my career. When I plotted this and I took a look and I was like, what is happening here? I'm doing, I'm, I'm pessimizing things, metrics are getting worse as expected, but time is getting better. So the sweet spot is like 255. So I have an array of 255 elements and I'm better off with a bunch of comparisons, a bunch of swaps, and it just works better. So I find this like really uh, weird and uh, disquieting because it means everything I learned from books is no longer valid. There's no, there's no, um, there's no compass for the territory we're in right now. There's no guidelines, there's no like, oh, you know, if you do this, it's gonna get better. You know what to do. You don't know what to do, I have no idea. So trying th silly things, we increase threshold, we increase comparisons, we increase swap, but time continues to drop down, and we got all the way down to 4% better over the baseline, which is a significant improvement. By the way, you, you shouldn't expect I'm gonna get like twice as fast as sort. It's not a high margin business. Right, it's like, like there's a theoretical limit you can't go under and we're kind of in that area. So this, you can't like say, oh, we improved like 2x. Whoa, this is awesome. So 4% is a, is a good result if we can reproduce it across a number of data shapes, right? But this kept on gnawing at me. What the heck is going on? How, what metrics can I define and use to improve my sorting? Comparisons are not good, swaps are not good. So here's what I tried. Collect D of N, the average distance between two subsequent array axes. So you have the array that you want to sort, and you read, you write, you read, you write at different positions in the array, and you collect the average distance between two successive axes. That's gonna give me an idea of what? Now you can say cache, yes. It's gonna give me an idea without actually uh, having a, a cache uh, specific um, uh, metric. It's gonna give me an, a cache oblivious uh, manner of saying, you know what, 
your algorithm is not as good because it does kind of weird accesses at different ends of the array, right? So I looked at the distance, and for quicksort, the distance is very large because partition always start from the, the end, the worst case. It's gonna start from the you know, opposite ends of the array, it's gonna go like that. That's quicksort partition. So mm, that's a problem, and uh, let's take a look at D of n. And indeed, it does go down with a threshold for both algorithms, and it goes down R for, actually no, it goes down R for the plane algorithm, so now, you're engineers, what do we do now? So we have two metrics that are weird. We have a third metric that's kind of there, but also it doesn't tell the whole story. So the solution is build a composite metric that encompasses all of the three. So you have a blended cost of your computation, which is C of n plus S of n, uh, M moves, M of n, plus a constant times D of n. And once you plot that, you're gonna see that it follows the time. So this is the right metric to use for improving sort algorithms. Throw away Cormac, throw away Knuth. Oh no, you shouldn't throw away Knuth. But you know, understand that this, there's no notion of this in all of the algorithm books in, we have. There is, however, in research, research literature, because research is just kind of ahead of everybody. It's kind of, there's a lot of research in uh, fast algorithms and how to, do, how to do them, how to implement them, and you can find papers on this kind of stuff. The books are obsolete. It's kind of a weird spot. The papers are kind of giving good information. The industry is giving good information because you know, they measure, right? And uh, the books are kind of out of, you know, out of date. So this is the right metric. You blend, compares, and swaps, and the average distance between two uh, array axes. That's going to give you a good proxy for a computation. But wait a second. Not all data is random, I hear you say. Well, more data, more measurements. So I measured on the following. This is a kind of a typical um, corpus. Sort the data, 0, 1, 2, all the way to n minus 1. Sort the data. Reversed, n minus 1 all the way down to 0. Organ pipe, right? Actually, I'm uh, wrong, because organ pipe goes a bit like this, because logarithmic, right? It goes like that and like that. But organ pipe, right? Goes up and down. Rotated. Instead of starting at zero, I start at one, and I go to n minus uh, one, and then I, uh, I put a zero at the end. Oh, it's the result of calling rotate begin plus one, end. Begin, begin plus one, end, right? So rotate did occur in this talk. <laughs> Thank you for the golf clap. And last but not least, we have like random data. I did my best to create some random data here for your pleasure. Zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one. This is random, believe me. Um, so random zero one is essentially n by two zeros, n by, n by two ones, all scrambled. This is gonna test a lot of duplicates in the sorted array, a lot of duplicates, but also high entropy, which is difficult, a difficult situation, right? A difficult case. And the key detail here does, is that you don't, get to, uh, you don't get to choose threshold depending on these statistics because you don't know them in, in advance. So what we do is we optimize threshold for random data because that's sort of the, that's the worst case, right? That's sort of the baseline. You optimize threshold for random data and then you test it on these guys and see what happens. I approach this measurement with huge trepidation because, for example, the sorted array is the happiest case for insertion sort. Just you do nothing. So partition is gonna do nothing, and then every insertion sort is gonna do nothing. So there's gonna be zero moves, and it's just gonna be a bonanza of like speed. That's why it's good to measure, friends. Sorted data. We destroy we destroy plane insertion. 9% improvement. 
by literally doing more work. I had a hard time explaining this to myself because this is really paradoxical. Like insertion is the happiest case for everything and the key, you know what the key is? The key is unguarded insertion. Because you do unguarded and the other guy must do guarded, they are at a disadvantage. So the fact that you get to make heap, which also is a no up, like no, make, make heap is not gonna move no data. The array is sorted. Any sorted array is a heap. But the fact that you don't know, to, you know the smallest element is already there, so you don't need to, to guard, is gonna save you one extra comparison per loop, which turns out to be uh, a win. So we have doing more work on a sorted array gives you an improvement. 9%, even more significant than for random data. Reverse data. We defile plain insertion. 3.7%, that would be the exact opposite. I have bad news for organ pipe though. We lose 4.6%. But here what I noticed is the following. Depending on the choice of threshold, I saw a seesaw in the runtime of heap insertion. It's very good, actually, this is sort of my, my worst case, the heap source worst case, because if you choose threshold, like instead of uh, 255 is like 200, you're gonna get a much better behavior on organ pipe. And that's because I need to investigate. So there's a seesaw behavior, it's like very bad, very good times, very bad times, very good times, very bad times, depending on threshold. So there is some chaotic behavior there that needs to be analyzed, needs to be looked at. And the nice thing is, you know, you notice it and you kind of study it. I didn't have time for this talk, but definitely there's something to be done there. On organ pipe, it's just a weird anomaly. That's why it's so good to test on so many data sets, right? It's beautiful. Rotated data. Rotated data. You know, I knew rotate is gonna mean trouble. I knew rotate was gonna be, mean trouble. So again, rotate is the smallest element is that at the end of the array. It's actually a, a, it's a plausible shape of data because you may have a sorted array, you add, you, you know, push back some new element, it turns out to be very small, right? It turns out rotated data hits GNU partition in the worst way, making quicksort quadratic. So all quicksort is irrelevant because it falls back to, to heap sort. You can't measure it. Fortunately, the Visual Studio folks don't fall for that trap. I've been talking to them. And the Clang folks don't fall for that trap. They have just a different, different way of doing things. So the result, the GNU, Lipstead, C++ team, you got homework. You can't afford this. This is a bug in the library because it's a plausible data shape. It's not a made up weird data shape. It's a plausible data shape that leads to worst case, okay? Also, I have a paper that also shows a worst case in GNU nth element, which also becomes quadratic. Nobody took notice. So if you know somebody, say something, all right? Nth element is broken on GNU. This is broken on GNU, okay? So with rotate account, the jury is uh, still out. Random zeros and ones. We obliterate plain insertion. Ob it's 25% is like a huge margin. Like pretty awesome. <clears throat> so the short result would be heapifying before insertion sort is going to be a significant win, significant in the scientific sense, you measure the significance. Significantly faster on most tested distributions. I want you to take a second to, re, to figure like the, the paradox here. It's a weird gambit, it's uh, doing more work. It is uh, unstructured because it doesn't, you know, it's not a smart method. I think it would be much smarter to make the heap and then sort the heap kind of cleverly a la smooth sort. Smooth sort does kind of that kind of thing. But it's very complicated. This is the problem with smooth sort. Nobody can implement it. 
So, and I think nobody can implement it real fast because there's so many, you know, so many details to it, so, so many kind of weird uh, corners of it. But if you just do the silly, stupid thing, you just make heap before the array with a good make heap, with a good push heap, please fix your li library STL implementers, then um, you're gonna be better in sorting. By the way, I gotta, you know, I gotta um, qualify here. Um, I kind of criticize the STL implementers because make heap is not fast enough, but <clears throat> They have like a whole standard library to implement and maintain. And make heap, how often do you call make heap in an application, make heap in one application? Like once, I make heap and then I mess with it, right? And here I come with this use case. Oh, I need make heap uh, 100,000 times. Nobody's gonna like, what's, what's the use case here? Well, there is a use case now, right? So you, you gotta make it fast. I wanted to share a few um, thoughts about this all with you. Because it looks like, what do we make of all this? This is kind of a bizarre uh, situation to be in. And there's this very nice notion in, uh, in philosophy, which is uh, first order thinking and second order thinking. And first order is like the immediate conclusions, the immediate, the obvious consequences of uh, certain uh, thoughts and situations and realities. That would be first order thinking. I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat a cookie, right? But there's also the second order thinking, which is like what we are good at, like, you know, advanced primates, right? And second order thinking is, you know, if I eat too many cookies, maybe I'm gonna get diabetes. So that would be kind of looking at the profound consequences of facts and situations. That would be second order and third order thinking, kind of thinking through the immediate because uh, there's a lot of immediate uh, conclusions I could draw here, like uh, throw the structures and algorithms books away, look at research papers and measure, that's all we can do. So, you know, the interest in the research is what's happening and the books are kind of weirdly out of date. Uh, devise your proper performance metrics and proxies and measure everything like a maniac. And most of all, try silly things because silly things are our ultimate line of defense in front of an unbearably complex machine, right? Try silly things. These are the first order conclusions. These are the immediate, like, if I can conclude my talk with this, that'll be fine. This is like, these are the things that I can say as a, as a closure to the ordeal we've been through, right? But there's actually, a bit of second order conclusion. Oh, by the way, sorry, sorry. I got, I got ahead of myself. First order conclusion, like overall, please remember this after the keynote is gone. Code that wants to be fast is left leaning. If you want to write fast code, you gotta be a kami. <laughs> and I understand the irony that you're hearing this in an Eastern European accent, okay? <laughs> If you, want, if you want fast code, you gotta be with the communists. That's how it goes. I don't make the rules. What do I mean by this? Repeatedly in my experience, including in this very code that I showed you today, in my experience, repeatedly, it counts that code that wants to be fast is left, goes to the left of the page. Goes to the left of the page, friends. You see what I'm saying? Feel it? So if you're like a loop and an if and a for and an s and a switch, it kind of you're nah, not gonna be fast, no. By the way, the Linux kernel, you know what the coding standard is? Eight characters tab, 80 characters line width. You can't write bad code on Linux, in the Linux kernel, you just can't. You can't write slow code there. And I think it has to do with uh, you know, complexity and also like speed. If you can, if the moment you have like too many ifs and decision points and whatnot, all that nonsense in your code, your kind of efficiency is out the window. And especially because there's many consequences to this, especially because you're gonna inevitably end up mixing hot and cold code, which is a anti-pattern inefficiency. You don't wanna do that. You wanna have hot code, together, hot code together, cold code together. That's why in all my routines, if you saw, I kind of, whenever I have a chance, I get the hell out of there. I break, I return, I get out, 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 and then I go to the fix up, which is, yeah, fine, this is cold code, I don't care that much. Right? So code that wants to be fast is left-leaning, does not mix hot and cold operations. 
does not make many decisions if and else is the anathema of fast computing, just integrate it as your normal arithmetic, okay? And that's, that's how you write fast code. But I was saying I was getting ahead of myself. There's a few second order conclusions to this, friends, and you're not gonna like them. <laughs> what is the perfect sort for the C++ programming language? Imagine I know, you know, essentially like white, it's a clean slate, you get to do everything you want, any, any way you want. Well, I can only assume that we're gonna have something like use hard-coded version for very small sizes. Up to five, I'm just coding the routines, and actually Clang does some of that. And uh, Visual Studio does also some of that. So use some hard-coded, like really quick inline code for the small cases. And then maybe for small integers and default ordering, let's use Radix sort, which is very fast and very nice, but it's only gonna work with small integers and the default less or greater, right? Certain predicates. And then maybe I'm gonna use uh, this uh, algorithm with quick sort and threshold and small sort and whatever, but the point is how do you choose the threshold? Because remember from the beginning of my talk, Visual Studio it was, thank you, 32, uh, uh, G, GNU was 16, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say that, not the same person should say the same thing. <laughs> 16, and Clang was, same person. It was what? No, it wasn't 30. It was 30 or six, depending on type characteristics. And this is where it all gets crazy, friends. This is where it gets like interesting. You choose threshold, actually choose threshold depending on many things depending on how much it costs to move things around. Whoa, how do I even measure that? Well, if it has trivial move, the cost of moving is proportional to size of, thank you. So we already have a notion of, oh, if it's a trivial uh, to move type, uh, I can make a calculation that's proportional to size of. That's gonna be the cost of my move in let's say compute cost units, right? Cost of comparison, ah, oh, that's, I told you, you can do anything you want, but it's, this is difficult. How do you estimate the cost of a lambda? What? Ideas, thoughts? So how do you, like, you know, I have a lambda, I'm gonna sort these uh, strings by length. And uh, you know, how do you, tell the, how do you tell the sort routine that your length comparison is actually one cycle? How do you convey that information from one end to the other of the algorithm. And this, friends, I think is an interesting problem. And I, this is like, all of, you know, all through working on this algorithm, I was thinking I'm working on doubles, but I want to make this generic. I want this to make for many types. And it was clear to me that threshold must be chosen depending on some weird minutia, depending on the type. So we have the cost of comparison, we have the size of M, we have, how about the data contiguity? Because if I sort a vector is one thing, but if I sort a deck, that's a different thing because all that distance between axes is gonna be different. It's gonna have a different impact. And I'm going to customize the algorithm everywhere depending on whether I have trivial move and copy. Because uh, if, you saw the, if you look at the algorithms, I'm gonna enregister some elements of the array, save them as temporaries, mess with them, then save them back, and that kind of stuff. You don't wanna do that if the element is expensive to copy. So depending on the cost of copying things around, careful here, depending of the, on the cost of copying things around, my implementation is going to have very many minute differences with regard to enregistering, creating temporaries, say, you know, you know, I have this temporary here if it's cheap, otherwise I don't use temporaries because it's expensive, right? And all of these, all of these decision points for the best sort algorithm are in tension with the tenets of generic programming. They're, they just run against it. This is not generic programming. This is like customize everything depending on types programming. It's not generic programming, friends. Dear colleagues, this is not it. What is it if it's not? How do you encode the cost of operations, for example? What mechanism do we have for that? How about user-defined attributes? You can devise a simple library in which you assign 
constants to primitive operations like compared to integers or whatever, and swap to integers and doubles and primitive types. So you have your baseline. You have your baseline cost in terms of elementary operations. And then you affix attributes to functions that are going to estimate and propagate those costs of computation. So then you have information with your lambda or with your function as to how much it should cost in terms of multiples of elementary operations. I wrote such a library for a different language. <laughs> so you have a very nice mechanism in terms of user-defined attributes and ca calculate uh, an algebra of user-defined attributes. You can devise, not difficult, that's going to allow you to convey, propagate, and inspect the estimated cost of doing operations. So then you can, in a lambda, you can say to the sort routine, my string compares, you know, my, my lambda costs like one elementary operation. So I'm looking at, and of course, the key here is that you get the introspection going. Because introspection is the way to communicate from the lambda predicate into the sort routine things. And in this case, the sort routine is going to introspect the lambda, the, the predicate, and it's going to, do you have this attribute complexity? Or cost. Do you have this attribute called cost? Yes, I do have it. What is the cost? Well, it's five times the comparison of two integers. Oh, cool. Then I'm going to choose threshold 42. 42. Right? 42. So whatever. There's no concept for that. Concepts just, just hit the wrong barn door. There's no concept for a type that's going to lead to a threshold of 42. It's just a simple introspection and you know, look at the type, see what it can do and whatever, right? If the introspection finds no user-defined attribute for the cost, it's going to use a simple heuristic to say, well, then I assume just generic, you know, generic cost uh, model, right? But the thing is you have the possibility to do so. So there's a tension because in generic programming, we look at uh, this uh, strategic approach, we define a few broad, categories like you have input iterators and forward iterators and all that nonsense, okay? And we devise algorithms and we specialize and all, all the good things. But actually, there's this whole thing which, in which I'm, I don't look at all that. It's I do, all, all I do is introspection. I look at the type, what you can do, what, you know, how much it costs, what you do, and you know, these kind of things. These kind, are you trivial to move? Are you easy to copy? And depending on that, I optimize, I, I, I um, change the design details of my algorithms in millions of ways. So each sort routine for each category of types is gonna be customized for that particular type in unexpected ways. And I've done this. I've done this for years. And it turns out it's unprecedented. You, what you get is like very small algorithms that work very well for very many types. That's what you can get. This is the, this is the shiny city on the hill that you can get with introspection. I've given this talk in Germany in November uh, last year. And it was about the next big thing in C++. What's the next big thing in C++? Introspection. This is what opens the, this is the key to the gate of hell. This is the key to the kingdom. This is what you, that's going to enable us to do many new, wonderful, amazing things. As opposed to other things that they don't, they maybe disable us from doing bad things, but I don't want to not do bad things. I want to do good things. You want to do good things. Welcome to my last public talk. <laughs> Generic programming is why we can't have nice things. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing laughter. <laughs> okay, like the two first, two first rows applauded. Everybody else is like frozen. It's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Please listen to me. I'm exaggerating, of course, but consider this. I've, I've tried to implement these algorithms for just, you know, a plenty of like everything on the STL and a lot more with a, a mindset that's generic programming, and I failed. And once I realized it's not the way, the right way to look at things, the right way to look at things is to introspect every type, customize infinitely your algorithms depending on the minute characteristics of the type. 
Do you, does, does this range know its length in advance in all of one? Because if it does, you're going to code a completely different algorithm than if it doesn't. That kind of stuff. And what we have with generic programming is like distance. We have like two specializations of distance and thank you very much. That's not enough. So I'm not saying, this is an exaggeration, of course. I'm not saying GP is bad. I'm not saying generic programming is bad. But it's not enough. So remember the 90s, OOP was all the craze. Inheritance and virtual functions, whee, awesome. And then the 2000 came, and journey programming came in C++, and everyone was like, yay, iterators and algorithms, whee. That's awesome. What's coming next? Design by introspection is coming next. Inspect and customize everything everywhere. We. <laughs> My friends, I understand I pushed a few buttons. I fully realize I pushed a few buttons. But this is in a good spirit. Right? Because if, all, if, you, all, if you all sat here right now and compliment each other on how great Rotate is, there will be no progress. Yeah, Rotate is great. Enough about it. I'm done with Rotate. I'm never going to use Rotate in my life anymore, okay? And infinite loops. Those are going to, you know, that kind of stuff. So progress comes when you kind of realize what we have and the mindset we have is not enough for what we want to do. What we want to achieve is the best sort. We can't achieve the best sort with generic programming. And even if I pushed a few buttons, you should know that like, this is like one of the best moments of my life. It's like an amazing crowd, an amazing community, and it's very good to be here. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We can take a few questions uh, at the microphones. We have a few minutes. Yes, Hi. please. Uh, thank you for the talk uh, first. Uh, second, regarding the replacing GIF statements with the arithmetic, uh, after watching a couple of uh, Matt Gobble's talk, I uh, come to think that the compiler, the compiler can do a really good job at it. So uh, yes. is it really necessary? Um, yeah, the compiler is very good at uh, finding these opportunities, but not good enough. You are better. So I noticed, like, uh, for example, in four uh, comparing jumps, the compiler replaces one, I replace the rest, the other three. So that's why goldbolt.org is such a good resource, because it tells you where you need to really work on it. Um, so the compilers are not there, not even close, not yet. Yeah. Yes, please. So thanks for the talk. Thank you. Um, I, I hope um, this is not obvious, and I'm just... Uh, not seeing it, but um, you don't really need the heap structure, right? So why do you um, not just, why do you do the push in the end? Why don't you just leave the element where it is and like the last element? X, uh, thank you very much for asking. This is, I wish somebody would ask that. So why do you worry about that last element and keep on pushing it into the heap? It turns out it's a 3%, it, it makes a difference. And you know why? Because it may so happen with random data that that's the smallest element. And there's a way, push heap is going to push it real fast, but kind of inserting it is going to be real slow. So on balance, it turns out it's an advantageous thing to do. But thanks for noticing. Thank you. Yes, please. In C++, we have enable if, and now we have uh, concepts. Um, do you consider that constraint-based programming distinct from uh, design by introspection? Or do you consider that birds of a feather? Constraint-based programming. Um, what, what, what is that? For instance, you uh, described inspecting based on whether size was order one and leveraging that. I can dispatch based on the presence of that with SVNA. Mm -hmm. um, is that along the lines of what you mean, or do you think that that's insufficient? Um, so let me re restate the question. So do you think that um, uh, sort of static dispatch based programming and uh, concepts are a good tool for what you want to do. Is that the right question? So far. So far. Um, I don't think they're the right tool. I think, 
Um, I think both are significantly difficult to use uh, tools that are not going to enable you to do the right, the right things everywhere. It's just going to, it's just too much. Uh, the algorithms end up being generic, but they're going to be like huge. It's very unpleasant to use the, these, uh, these tools. And concepts, with concepts, like, um, you can't express as a concept, uh, you know, si the concept of all types with size 16. Oh, yeah, I have the concept of all size types size 24 and so on. There's no such a thing with concepts. You know, you just got to do introspection, not define concepts, and just use what you got by looking at types. Yes, uh, yes please. Hi, uh, David Holman, Sandy National Labs. Thank you uh, for your mention of user-defined attributes. I know um, that maybe these days you don't get as much time to follow the committee activities, but we actually have essentially a proposal for a library-level solution making its way through the committee right now, uh, P1393 properties, that uh, essentially addresses this concern where you have user-defined extra semantic uh, pieces of information that can be used for optimization, like thresholds that can be attached to the top level and then use generic in generic code. Have you seen any of that? Um, Correct. Yeah, I was. Yeah, so I, that's what I was referring to. Sorry for not making that clear. Um, it's my take that attributes are like the essential tool for introspection-based design. Okay, they're the essential tool because they allow you to carry information through statically across function call boundaries. Um, Attributes without introspection is like a wedding without music, right? Introspection without attributes is, I don't know, like another wedding with no music, right? So it's, you want to have both. Thank you for, uh, for the announcement. Yes, please. John plays grammar tech. Uh, there's a branch of complexity theory called parametric complexity theory. Called? And parametric complexity. Parametric complexity, yeah. This is uh, Downey, uh, I'll, I'll give you the names later. They, the idea is that you don't just worry about the size of a data set, but also certain parameters uh, describing the actual structure of the data. And so a lot of problems which might, in theory, be uh, very expensive turn out to be quite practical given the structure of the data. My impression is that what you're proposing is parametric algorithm design. Which, and it's very much an analyzable with the parametric complexity basis. Thanks for the mention. Um, so essentially, this whole um, this whole uh, user-defined attributes and complexity and this can, there's a lot of research in the area and there's languages that do that sort of by default. They, they don't need annotations. They kind of deduce the cost of operations and stuff. So definitely, this is related to that. But here, I'm being a bit more modest. I'm just looking at heuristics to uh, to assess the cost of operations, not something really precise. But yeah, there is a lot of research and development in the area. Yes, please. Hi my, hi, my name is Sheldon, representing Snapchat. And the improvements, the 3% improvement to random data was really impressive. Thank and you. It seems like you'll be able to pull it into stood sort. Do you have That'd an awesome. idea of the, the practical bounds here? In other words, how many more 3% improvements to stood sort do you think we might see for random data? How many more 3% improvements can we squeeze? Uh, I suspect there's more. And I suspect if, if you, uh, so if you take this idea, and build the other two, three ideas on top of it is going to compound. Because there's a lot of smart things you can do once you have the heap in place. You can kind of be clever about it. What I do is like just like a silly like insertion sort. But I do believe there's, uh, there's more room to go. There's plenty. That's why I present this idea not as the uh, sort of the end of, uh, it's not the end of something, it's the beginning of something. Because right now, a lot of people have heard of it. And they're like, oh, wait a second. What if I do that? Yeah. Yes, please. So in your combined uh, speed estimation function of m plus uh, c plus kd over n, you said it was k was some constant. What was that? It was 1 by 500. I, I handpick it because there's no easy way to mix this. I, I uh, chose it to fit the curve, right? It's 1, by, it's 1 divided by 500. It just turns out it's a nice number. But yeah, you got to... One of my to-dos is to figure out a principled way of computing that k. Thank you for thank you for asking. Hello. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, have you tested this on different CPU architectures, and also whether you would want to introspect on <coughs> that? I tested it only on Intel, but different Intel machines, like laptops and every I, I got at home, right? Um, I suspect on other machines you're going to get different results, but. There's only this much you can reduce the comparisons and swaps and not, get, not see an improvement. 
So the fact that it reduces the comparisons and swaps and the distance is a clear indication that we're heading the right direction. So I suspect it's gonna work well on other machines as, as well. Thank you, yes please. Uh, more follow-up to questions about the, the heap portion of, of the algorithm. Uh, there are other algorithms that will also provide the first three or however many uh, elements, elements already sorted. Is that the primary goal of creating the heap? And if, if so, uh, what other algorithms and parameterization points <coughs> to maybe pull out four or five or six of the first initial ones? Or is there something more fundamental about the heap structure that is offering the improvement? Thank you. I think the heap is, um, is a very subtle and interesting data structure. It has some informational properties that, for example, is the minimum number of comparisons that you can get for that structure. So in the heap, I noticed, for example, there's this other question. Well, how about that last term? Do you care to push heap it in the, it turns out it does make a difference. So the heap is not only that I get the smallest three elements at the beginning, it's also that I get these sorted subarrays, these sorted like, uh, if you wish, um, uh, spans in the array that are also sorted, they're of small length, they're log n length, but there are many, you know, there are quite a few. And uh, it's uh, the entire structure that helps, it's not only the top three elements. But thank you for asking, it's uh, excellent, yes. So if we had an ability to say how much a copy was or anything like that, how could we do things like, um, saying how long a branch predictor is going to be hot or how this ah. algorithm is going to be there. Like you mentioned, that seemed like a big point of it, but how could that be conveyed? How can you convey the cost of a branch prediction failure and that kind of stuff, right? Or even how often my algorithm is going to fail to be, you know, it's going to be more, it's going to have a high probability or highly uh, Well, you know, there's likely, there's the macro likely. That's kind of the bottom, you know, the first line of resistance, we have like the means to kind of hard code the, the likely. But um, I think that's a hard problem, really. You can encode, it's gonna cost me this many comparisons, but it's difficult to say, well, you know, the probability of a successful comparison is that. You know, I, I didn't, this is second, second order thinking, I love it. You know, it's gonna really take things forward. Yes, please, Eric. Uh, so if you, if you have these attributes that say, how, how much does a copy cost, say, and I have to hand tune it and say that it, it costs like four units, and then I go ahead and add an extra member to my class, and now I have to go and change it and say it's now five units, so it kind of becomes unmaintainable. Um, the maintenance issue is real, but you don't say five units, you say five times the element is, you say, that's why introspection is needed, because you need to say member, you know, members, uh, member count times this, you know, size of times this elementary cost. So you don't say a hard number, you just say proportional to your, uh, to your number of elements in the, in the structure. So it should all, except for the primitive operations, it should be all propagated and computed uh, depending on the, intros the results of introspection. Thank you very much for asking. Yes, please, Jens. Um, hi, Jens Miller. Um, does your code hold up against the spectral fixes? Because you're like a lot of, depending on the branch prediction. So come again? The spectrum, uh, the spectral fixes and the other box which were in the Branch predictor. The spectra, oh, the, the specter? Yeah. I'm out of my depth here, so I'm, I'm, I don't know. It's a, it's a good research direction. I'm gonna take one more question. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, what we were saying at the end reminded me uh, uh, to one interview where it, there is one sentence saying uh, one of the things that is central to generic programming as I understand it now is that complexity, or, or at least some general notion of complexity, has to be associated with an operation. And that's uh, from 95, Alex Stepan of the interview to Dobbs Journal. So does this somehow ties in with that, or I got It is definitely wrong? preternatural, and I think, so I have this library in which you can actually say big O of this algorithm is uh, the first parameter times log, log the first parameter. So you can say sort has, the, complete, the old big o, big o complexity and cost of operations, different things, right? Because it's amortization and all that nonsense, right? So it's different algebra. But with, uh, I think that, that was pretty natural step on of to say, hey, you know, we should have that. And yes, we should have that in the form of attributes that are, have an algebra on top of them and are transportable and are, you know, they can be passed around and computed. And, and uh, so you should know by looking at the signature of sort is gonna be in log n. And that's possible with user-defined attributes. Thank you.
Okay, thanks again very much for those of you who stayed. Thank you.